It may seem odd that information is connected to randomness, but in fact, the two are closely related. Imagine a string of digits made only of ones and zeros. The string consisting of just ten ones is completely orderly and because of this contains practically no information. On the other hand, the string 0001100110, which was generated randomly, has the maximum amount of information possible for its length. The reason for this is that one way of quantifying information is the amount by which the data can be compressed. A truly random string can't be written in any shorter way while retaining all of its information. But a long constant string with only ones, for example, can be compressed enormously just by listing the number of ones in the string, as I did. Information and disorder are intimately related. The more disordered and random a string is, the more information it has within it. Another way to think of this is that in the case of a random string, revealing the next bit gives the maximum amount of information possible. On the other hand, if we see a string that consists of just ten ones, it's trivial to guess the next bit. That only applies to one string as a whole, not part of another string. An arbitrarily long random string will contain ten ones infinitely often. Useful stimuli, as far as we are concerned, must necessarily occupy a middle ground between these extremes of information. For example, a photograph with minimum information would be a blank monochromatic picture, and a book would be a long repetition of pages filled with one letter. Neither of these are in any way interesting in terms of their information content. However, a photograph with maximum information would look like a random mess of static, and a book would be a jumble of random letters. These again wouldn't appeal to us. What we need, and is most useful to us, is something in between. A conventional photo conveys information, but in a form and quantity that we can understand. One pixel may be blue, in which case the nearby pixels are generally either blue or white. We know this, and can use it to compress pictures without losing the information. A typical book is mostly just a string of letters and spaces with punctuation marks. Unlike in extreme books that contain a jumble of symbols or all the same one, these letters fall into structured patterns known as words, some of which occur occasionally and some that recur extremely frequently, such as the. In addition, these words follow certain rules known as grammar to form sentences and so on, so that ultimately the reader can understand the information being conveyed. This simply doesn't happen in a random hodgepodge. In his short story, The Library of Babel, the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges tells of a library, vast, possibly infinite in size, that contains a dizzying number of books. All the books are of identical format. Each book contains 410 pages, each page 40 lines, each line approximately 80 black letters. Only 22 alphabetic characters plus a comma, full stop and space are used throughout, but every possible combination of these characters that follow the common format occurs in some book in the library. Most books appear to be just a meaningless jumble of characters. Others are quite orderly, but still devoid of any apparent meaning. For example, one book contains just the letter M repeated over and over. Another is exactly the same, except that the second letter is replaced by an N. Others have words, sentences and whole paragraphs that are grammatically correct in some language, but are nevertheless illogical. Some are true histories. Some purport to be true histories, but are in fact fictional. Some contain descriptions of devices yet to be invented or discoveries yet to be made. 
Somewhere in the library is a book that contains every combination of the basic 25 symbols that can be imagined or written down in the given format. Yet of course it's all useless because without knowing in advance what's true or false, fact or fiction, meaningful or meaningless, such exhaustive combinations of symbols have no value. It's the same with the old idea of monkeys randomly hitting the keys of typewriters and eventually given enough time coming up with the works of Shakespeare. They'd also come up with the solutions to every major problem in science after countless trillions of years. The trouble is they'd also come up with every non-solution and every convincing refutation of the true solutions and for the most part mind-numbing quantities of pure gobbledygook. Having the answer before you is no use at all if you also have every other possible variant of the symbols that make up the answer and you've no way of knowing which one is right. In a sense the world wide web with its vast collection of knowledge available alongside an even more enormous body of gossip, half-truths and pure nonsense is becoming like Borgia's library, a repository of everything from the profound to the nonsensical. In recent years, mathematicians have been striving for an overarching theory of randomness that might connect seemingly very different phenomena in science, from Brownian motion to string theory. Two researchers, Scott Sheffield at MIT and Jason Miller at the University of Cambridge, have found that many of the 2D shapes or paths that can be generated by random processes fall into distinct families, each with its own set of characteristics. Their classification has led to the discovery of unexpected links between what on the face of it look like totally disparate random objects. The first kind of random shape to be explored mathematically is the so-called random walk. Imagine a drunkard who starts from a lamppost and staggers from one point to another, each step, assumed to be of equal length, being taken in a random direction. The problem is to work out how far from the lamppost he's likely to be after a given number of steps. This can be reduced to a one-dimensional case, in other words just movements back and forth along a line by supposing that at each step a coin is tossed to decide which way to move, right or left. The problem was first given a real-world application in 1827 when the English botanist Robert Brown drew attention to what became known as Brownian motion, the haphazard jiggling of pollen grains in water when looked at through a microscope. Later it was realized that the jiggling was due to individual water molecules striking the pollen grains from different random directions, so that each pollen grain behaved like the drunkard in our original example. It took until the 1920s for the mathematics of Brownian motion to be fully worked out by the American mathematician and philosopher Norbert Wiener. The trick is to figure out what happens to the random walk problem as the steps and the time between them are made smaller and smaller. The resulting random paths look very much like those of Brownian motion. More recently physicists have become interested in random motion of a different kind involving not particles following 1D curves but incredibly tiny wriggling strings whose motion can be represented as 2D surfaces. These are the strings of string theory, a leading but as yet unproven theory of the fundamental particles that make up all matter. As Scott Sheffield put it, to make sense of quantum physics for strings, you want to have something like Brownian motion for surfaces. The beginnings of such a theory came in the 1980s thanks to physicist Alexander Polyarkov, now at Princeton University. He came up with a way of describing these surfaces that's now known as Liouville Quantum Gravity, LQG. A separate development called the Brownian model also described random 2D surfaces but gave different complementary information about them. 
Sheffield and Miller's big breakthrough was to show these two theoretical approaches, LQG and the Brownian model, are equivalent. There's still work to be done before the unified theory can be applied directly to problems in physics, whether it be at the ultimately small scale of strings or on an everyday level to phenomena such as the growth of snowflakes or mineral deposits. Already clear is that randomness lies at the heart of the physical universe, and at the heart of randomness is maths.